Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending this week's Brown Bag Launch Seminar. And this, week we have, uh, uh, this week we have two presentations. The first one is from Austin Rose. Austin is currently a fourth year aerospace student in the uh, bachelor and master program. He has been working on the Space Shot project for three semesters with Dr. John Deck. Outside of academics, Austin has had experience working at multiple companies over the last four years in areas ranging from air traffic management to autonomous drone software. And today he will talk about uh, the project he worked on Space Shot. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Sun. So, as you just mentioned, I am Austin Rose, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about our project Space Shot. Um, before we get into it, I'm going to go over a quick outline of how things are going to run this presentation. I'm going to go over the uh, problem a little bit and some of the background information that will be necessary to understand the modeling. And uh, we'll go into the modeling, the uh, methodology behind the mod modeling, and some of the assumptions that were made. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the results, how we verified and validated those, and the future of this project. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. Um, the general idea here is that the uh, number of satellites orbiting Earth is planned to increase by a factor of five over the next five to ten years. Um, given that the uh, launch methods haven't changed all that much since uh, the first satellite was launched in 1957, there's a need for a cheaper and more environmentally conscious way of getting to space. Um, one of the major problems is that the typical payload fraction for one of these missions is anywhere from one to ten percent of the overall mass of the vehicle. Um, which means 1 to 10 percent of the takeoff mass is what's actually getting to space, which is not a very large fraction. So what SpaceShot is trying to do is provide the conceptual development for a hybrid launch system from a magnetic launch track to a secondary onboard propulsion system to reduce the cost of getting to space, mainly for the deployment of these small satellites. So when we talk about the payload not being a very large percentage of the takeoff weight, uh, one of the current most efficient uh, carriers in uh, getting things to space is SpaceX. Um, and their Falcon 9 has a takeoff weight of 600 tons, but can only carry about a 15 ton payload, uh, which computes to about a 2.5% payload fraction for the Falcon 9. The Falcon Heavy weighs 1,420 tons at takeoff and can only bring a 30 ton payload to space, which is about 2.1% payload fraction. So uh, SpaceX being one of the most efficient carriers is still uh, very inefficient in terms of how uh, much payload they can bring to space. On top of that, um, there are currently about 3,500 operational satellites in orbit. Um, there's about 6,000 total satellites. Um, the rest have been decommissioned at this point. Uh, and Starlink alone plans to launch 42,000 satellites over the next five to 10 years. So that's a seven time increase based on the number that are out there currently. Um, the current cost to fuel a Falcon 9 for one of these missions, uh, which brings about 60 Starlink satellites up every time, is $200,000 per mission. Um, so with 42,000 Starlink satellites, that's about 140 million in fuel over the next uh, five to 10 years, which is significant not only financially, but also in terms of the environmental impact of uh, that kind of fuel usage and number of launches. Uh, you can see in the figure on the right from The Economist, they forecast up to 24,000 launches a year nearly by uh, the year 2027. So this is definitely a uh, large market and a large number of launches and satellites and things going to space. So we plan to use uh, a maglev track to impart an initial velocity on the vehicle and there for reduce the cost of fuel needed to get into space. Um, so these maglev tracks and trains have been around for a couple years now. Uh, one of the first one that uses the linear synchronous motor, which is the technology that we'll be employing, uh, was the Trans Rapid train, which was uh, launched in 2004 in Shanghai. That train is capable of reaching speeds of about 450 kilometers an hour. Um, and more recently, uh, the superconducting uh, train uh, made by the Japanese company L0 has reached speeds of over 600 kilometers an hour. Um, so that's a pretty significant increase in uh, only the last 10 or 15 years. So uh, we're very confident that this technology is getting to a spot that we would be comfortable using it on this kind of mission. Um, there's also 
uh, proposals for future concepts that use this kind of technology from uh, the Hyperloop concept, which is another Elon Musk idea that uses a maglev track in a vacuum tunnel for high speed passenger transportation. Um, and then there's a concept called Star Tram, which is similar to Space Shot in that it uses a magnetic launch track to launch a vehicle, um, but a different in that it was uh, only a magnetic launch track used to launch a vehicle, and there's no secondary onboard propulsion system for that concept. Um, so we're, there are some uh, ideas out there that are similar, um, but nothing quite like Space Shot. Um, so what we're trying to do, and it's depicted in this artistic representation on the right, is basically create a track, a maglev track, up a mountain, um, encapsulated in a tube that would be used to uh, get a rocket going or vehicle going up to 1,000 kilometers an hour or faster before then launching it and having a secondary onboard propulsion system bring it the rest of the way to orbit. Um, so for this analysis, we chose Mount Elbert in the Rockies. Uh, it's one of the highest peaks in the Rockies, has a 10,000 foot base and a 14,000 foot summit. Um, and we're assuming that our launch tube is filled with helium. And this was done for two reasons. Uh, number one, helium has about 20% the density of air at this altitude. Uh, so we can uh, very much reduce the effects of drag on the vehicle as we're launching. Uh, and the second is that the speed of sound in helium is about a thousand meters per second. So we wouldn't have to worry about any uh, shocks occurring in the launch tube, uh, which would further simplify the analysis and increase the stability of the vehicle in the launch tube. Um, as far as the vehicle goes, we're basing our model based on the Rocket Lab Electron rocket. Uh, and the simplified geometry that we're using is shown in the figure on the right. It's a two stage rocket. Um, the green stage at the bottom is the first stage and the yellow stage uh, in the middle is the second stage. It's got a radius of about four feet and an overall length with all uh, stages attached of about 60 feet. Um, and the red cone and cylinder at the top represent the payload fairing and the kick stage. Uh, however, the kick stage thrust effect is being neglected for this analysis. Um, as far as the modeling goes, the Earth is considered to be oblate following the WGS-84 model. We're using a standard atmosphere following the international standard. Um, but for the vehicle, we are going to assume six degree of freedom dynamics. So we'll be taking into account not only the X, Y, and Z position of the vehicle at every time, but also the attitude or the roll, pitch, and yaw of the vehicle. Um, and because we're doing this, we'll also need to take into account the inertia and the fact that the inertia is changing over time due to the uh, use of fuel and the fact that the fuel is depleting. Um, so this inertia is calculated dynamically based off that fuel percentage. Um, we assume no fuel sloshing um, so that when the pitch program begins, we assume that all the fuel kind of stays rested against the base of the rocket. Um, and I'll talk about why we made that assumption later and what we can do to correct for that. Um, for the model, we use a fixed time step of one second. Uh, we originally experimented with a tenth of a second and even hundredth of a second uh, time steps, but the simulation time in order to collect the data we needed was getting to be on the order of days, uh, so it wasn't feasible to use anything smaller than a second. Um, and for the solver, we're using MATLAB's built-in ODE14 extrapolation method, uh, which is an explicit solver or an implicit solver but has a better uh, performance uh, as compared to the explicit solvers for a fixed time step. So now that I've given you a little bit of the background to the project, uh, it's a, it's tough to experiment with a maglev track and a launch vehicle system in uh, real life. So we're our goal is to create a high fidelity simulated environment that we can test and compare these two um, systems and see which one performs actually better. So for the original case, we're assuming a traditional launch uh, starting at sea level at rest versus the hybrid case where we're assuming a non-zero initial velocity and altitude. Um, and we're assuming, uh, we're gonna start simulating the vehicle as soon as it exits the launch tube. So we'll be ignoring the shocks in the launch tube for this simulation um, and assuming that there are none and also assuming that uh, we can neglect the interaction between the vehicle and the atmosphere right as it exits the launch tube. Um, and I'll talk about how we can uh, correct for that later as well. 
So to go a little bit more into these initial conditions, um, so for the original case, we're starting at sea level at uh, zero velocity, and we're using the two-stage rocket uh, versus the single stage that is used for the hybrid case. Uh, both stages use a 110-pound payload. Um, for the hybrid case, the pitch program is going to begin five seconds after it exits the launch tube or five seconds after the simulation starts in this case, uh, whereas the original case, the pitch program begins about 15,000 feet. Um, one of the important differences between the hybrid and the original case is that the hybrid case assumes a 30% fuel reduction in takeoff mass. Um, and this is, I'll talk about how we got to that number uh, in the results section and also uh, what we can do to increase that number in the future. Um, for the actual model, uh, this was done in Simulink, which is a MATLAB tool. Uh, and there's four main components to this model. Uh, Starting from the left, you've got the red control system, which takes in the Euler angle inputs and provides a thrust vectoring and thrust uh, throttle percentage output for the flight dynamics subsystem, which then uh, integrates the position and velocity of the vehicle over time based on the applied forces. And then the orange box in the right middle uh, animates the uh, position of the vehicle over time using flight gear which I'll show in a couple slides. And the green uh, subsystem on the right takes into account all of these positions and velocities and determines the orbital parameters of the vehicle at a given time. Um, for the flight dynamics, as I mentioned, it takes in a thrust vectoring input and a throttle percentage and determines the forces of drag, gravity, and thrust, which is the main force that we'll be considering in this model. Um, and then using a six degree of freedom quaternion model uh, with variable mass, we are able to integrate the position velocity and also determine the uh, attitude and the various attitude rates for the vehicle at every time. Uh, this also takes into account um, the atmosphere and the density of the atmosphere at a given altitude, as well as the Mach number of the vehicle and so on. So on this side, I've got two animations. Uh, on the right, which we'll start playing first, is the flight gear animation, uh, which shows the vehicle uh, animated in a GUI interface. This is for the original case. And you can see the pitch program initiate and actuate. Um, and you can see that one of the downsides of the one second step size is that it's a little um, violent in its changes due to the uh, use of the PID controller. But that's something that would be improved for the smaller step size. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a 3D plot showing the position and the trajectory of both the initial and the hybrid uh, launch systems um, and as they launch from Earth and get into orbit. Um, both simulations were done for about 600 seconds. Uh, this is because the Rocket Lab advertises about a 540-second uh, burn time for the two-stage rocket, so we wanted to give plenty of time for them to get into orbit and then start to propagate that orbit. Um, as far as the results, uh, using this 30 or almost 31% fuel reduction, we were able to get both rockets to uh, have nearly the same orbit within 2% difference in injection radius and 10% difference in injection velocity. Uh, these differences can be attributed to uh, the differences in when the pitch program started. As I mentioned earlier, for the original case, it starts at 15,000 feet whereas for the hybrid case, it started about five seconds after launch. So that uh, small difference would propagate and uh, result in the error that you can kind of see in that diagram on the right. Um, but this is overall very close. Um, and as you can see here on the right-hand side, uh, all it would really take is a small apogee raise, which could be done with a kick stage and much less fuel um, to get these orbits to align and make everything line up. Um, while we didn't have any direct data to compare this with from Rocket Lab. Uh, the orbital parameters do fall within the range that they suggest their rockets are capable of. So we believe this data is accurate um, and uh, can be used for analysis. Um, and as far as that analysis goes, this 30% fuel reduction uh, results in about $50 million in savings in fuel alone for the Starlink launches. Um, it doesn't take into account any reduction in structure that would be needed, uh, 
or uh, infrastructure, but between in fuel alone, $50 million in savings is nothing to scoff at. Um, uh, on the figure on the right, you can see an uh, image depicting all of the NASA small and CubeSat missions uh, that are both active presently and planned for the future, with the ones planned for the future being in bold. Um, so you can see that on top of Starlink, there's also plenty of desire uh, from NASA to be using these small sat and cube sats, um, and therefore a uh, desire to launch those more efficiently and environmentally friendly. 30% um, is also a fairly um, conservative guess for how much fuel would be saved in order to get the same or orbit. Uh, it was based on the 1,000 kilometer launch velocity, uh, which is very conservative estimate uh, for the launch velocity using the ratio of the densities between helium and air uh, and the force of drag being the main uh, slowing force for the magnetic track. Uh, analysis suggests that we should be able to reach at least 1400 kilometers an hour, if not more than that, which would further uh, reduce the amount of fuel that we would need to have on that second stage. Um, but uh, 30% based on the 1,000 kilometer estimate is still very good. We're very happy with those results. Um, as far as the future of this project goes, uh, the first things we'd want to be doing are increasing the fidelity of the model, taking into account some of those things I mentioned earlier, like fuel sloshing, um, as well as the interaction of the vehicle as it exits the launch tube, because that would be uh, definitely an area that we would want to make sure we understand the dynamics and the aerodynamics at that point. Um, we'd also want to be further investigating this maglev propulsion. Most of the research that was done so far is based off of systems that currently exist. Um, so we'd want to be able to do our own research and see what maximum speeds we could attain using the linear synchronous motor system. Um, and also, if we plan to use superconductors, we want to make sure that we have good heat analysis of the vehicle while it's in the launch tube because superconductors only uh, display the properties that we would need them to at very low temperatures ranging from zero to 100 Kelvin. Um, after that, we would want to compare the, uh, the cost of these two things. How much does it cost to build this launch track versus how much are we saving uh, for each launch and figure out is this economically feasible and reasonable? Um, but uh, initial analysis suggests that not only is this reasonable, but it actually is uh, very good for the environment and for the uh, financial health of a lot of these companies. Um, and lastly, we'd want to be migrating the model to a more efficient language. Uh, while MATLAB is great for uh, simulating and they have a lot of pre-built functions that were very useful for developing this model, uh, the one second uh, step size uh, is very large, and in order to get a more accurate model, we want to be reducing that, uh, and using a language like Python or C++ would probably be very helpful in allowing the simulation to run faster. Um, so with that, I will be glad to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very nice talk. Are there any questions from the audience? You can send the questions using the chat function. Uh, so while we are waiting, so I have a question I would like to ask. Uh, you mentioned sure. you're going to use helium during the launch. Uh, yes. Do you know uh, or have you ever calculated how much helium you're going to use? Um, so that would depend on the size of the track. One thing we yeah. had a hard time um, getting data for was the uh, forces that we could use. Uh, when using the track because the rocket will technically be accelerating uphill. So we're not sure uh, as to the length of the track that we would require. Yeah. Um, so that would be the primary determining factor in uh, kind of the slope that we were able to use when going up this mountain. Um, okay. That would determine how much volume of helium uh, we would need. I see. The reason I'm asking is because helium is very expensive now. And also, there is a global shortage of helium. So that is one of the problems I am facing <laughs> in my work. The cost is just so high. I know it's nice, but yeah. it's so high. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wish uh, I had a better answer for you. Um, uh, but unfortunately, okay. that's still uh, up in the air. Yeah. Uh -huh. Completely understand. And uh, there are two questions in the chat. One is, uh, are you thinking about uh, developing cost model from the ground up? 
uh, or use existing cost model? Uh, we would probably have to use uh, at least an existing cost model to start the analysis. Ideally, we'd want to build our own from the ground up because we're doing things a little bit differently than uh, they have been done on maglev tracks and things like that. Um, but at least initially, it would be using the cost models that exist out there already um, to determine how much our estimate would be. Okay, and uh, another question is, what is the legality of uh, launching over land currently? So that is a very good question and one that we were looking into as well. Um, we chose Mount Elbert because it uh, is the tallest peak in the Rockies and proved to be a good, uh, easy to find data on. Um, but ideally we would probably be launching somewhere that was farther away from civilization uh, and not as close because there is a risk that something could go wrong with the launch. Um, so we'd probably try to find a mountain range that was more uh, either further away from civilization or closer to the ocean or something like that. Um, but I don't know the exact legality of launching this close to other people. Okay, certainly. Um, how many Starlinks would the rocket you are proposing be able to launch? Um, so the... One in our proposal has a 110 pound uh, payload, which I believe is about five Starlink satellites. I could be wrong on that. Um, so it's not as many as the Falcon 9. Um, but one of the reasons we chose the Electron rocket is because it's so small uh, and so maneuverable and uh, may not have the capacity of the Falcon 9 or the Falcon Heavy, but uh, is a lot easier to use and a lot cheaper. Um, it would also be easier to fit in a kind of launch tube or launch track like this. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the questions we have for you today. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's switch to Pranav. Enough. Can you go ahead and share your screen? Uh, okay, yeah, I can see it now. Okay, no problem. Um, yeah. Okay, everybody, so the second talk today is from Pernov. He is a third year aerospace engineering student graduating this May. His research is in EVTOL sizing and performance with Dr. Brent German. And he will be returning to graduate school in the fall to continue his work with Dr. German. He is also a team lead for the Georgia Tech Design Build Fly Club. Okay, a pronoun, all yours. Thank you. Um, so today I'll be talking about a three degree of freedom longitudinal trim code that was developed to characterize an over-actuated EV tow aircraft during transition. So a brief out outline of my presentation. First, I'll give an overview uh, about urban air mobility and what it what it is, then I'll discuss my research objective along with the methodology and the model that I created for the, uh, for, uh, the transition uh, model. This includes the aerodynamic model, a rotor model, a force and moment accounting routine, and an optimization routine. I'll discuss some of the initial results we've gotten from this 3 off code, and then finally I'll talk about some of the future work that we're planning on implementing. So, for people who don't know, urban air mobility is an ecosystem of flying intercity aircraft that facilitates passenger and cargo transport. Morgan Stanley estimates that this sector of uh, the uh, aerospace industry will be worth around $1.5 trillion uh, by 2040, which means hopefully we'll be having uh, aircraft flying in large cities like Atlanta uh, very, very soon. Some of the key technical challenges to make this uh, Possible include decreasing the noise signature of the aircraft, because if you have hundreds of aircrafts flying above a city, it can be very disturbing to residents. This drives a lot of the con uh, configuration selections and uh, design of the aircraft. Second is certification. The FAA currently doesn't have very many regulations governing the safety for electric uh, aircraft, and especially those that, are ver that have vertical takeoff and landing. So there's a large effort being put into uh, developing those regulations. Third is the vision for urban air mobility is to eventually get to a point where these aircraft can be completely autonomous. So developing the control laws and the 
making the autonomous uh, code robust enough for the flight to actually happen is a key research area that has yet to be uh, explored very much. Finally, obviously, if you have lots of aircraft uh, flying around at very low altitudes, you need to have very good air traffic management to ensure that they don't collide with each other or collide with buildings or interfere with the airspace of larger aircraft above. So recently, there have been a lot of different companies and startups that have sprung up to propose concepts and build aircraft related to urban air mobility. Some companies have already started flying their aircraft. Uh, notable companies include Joby Aviation, Volocopter, and Lilium. Several other companies have also proposed general concepts for aircraft that they are planning on developing. As you can see, for a lot of these aircraft, there are new configurations with multiple rotors to take advantage of the electric powertrain that they'll be using. This um, means that a lot of these configurations are overactuated in almost every single control axis of the aircraft. This presents an interesting problem because uh, since you have so many actuators for these aircraft, there are multiple ways that you can uh, fly the aircraft, especially when you're transitioning from a hover segment of the mission to a cruise portion of the mission. That brings me to my research objective, which was to create a uh, three degree of freedom model, a uh, three degree of freedom model to characterize the behavior of a uh, eVTOL aircraft with tilting rotors during transition from uh, hover to cruise. Uh, we wanted to explore and analyze optimal transition corridors for these types of aircraft with various objective functions such as decreasing power. For the main analysis, uh, we decided to select an eight rotor configuration because it provided relevance to some of the other projects that we're uh, doing in Dr. German's lab. This eight rotor configuration shown on the right consists of four rotors in the rear, which are used only for uh, hover, and then four rotors in the front, which uh, tilt from uh, vertical to horizontal to provide uh, thrust in the uh, air airplane mode for the aircraft. The three degree of freedom uh, code is uh, split into multiple different uh, components. The inputs to the code are a given uh, flight speed and a flight path angle, which are fed into an aerodynamics model for the fuselage wing and tail and a rotor model to calculate the forces uh, from all of those components. Those forces and moments are then fed into a force moment accounting routine, which takes the aircraft mass properties and geometry definition and calculates the accelerations and angular accelerations of the aircraft. Those accelerations are then fed into the optimizer, which uh, trims the aircraft and finds the most optimal solution uh, for uh, the uh, aircraft and outputs the trimmed state of the aircraft. The, the outputs include things like aircraft angle of attack, the flap deflection, the incidence of the tail, the front tilt, uh, front rotor tilt, and the RPM of the rotors. The configuration we're analyzing is it has an all-moving tail, which is why uh, uh, the state includes the incidence of the tail and not just an elevator. This analysis is done in a quasi-steady fashion because uh, in order to simplify uh, the models, and make sure that we're able to optimize a lot of cases in a short amount of time. Additionally, no interactional effects are modeled currently because of their complexity uh, and um, in order to increase the amount of cases that we can run so that the optimizer is able to run fast enough. Open MDAO is used to uh, create all of these models in Python and link them together and provides the framework for optimization. The specific optimizer that we chose was the stopped optimizer or the sparse nonlinear optimizer because uh, it provides excellent speed and allows for a lot of controllability. The aerodynamics model consists of uh, uh, models from AVL uh, where we analyze the linear stability derivatives and the control surface deflection increments for each portion of the aircraft. The aircraft is split and isolated into uh, only the wing and the tail and the fuselage to ensure that there are uh, no interactional effects taken into account. Uh, the, uh, the 
drag estimation for the fuselage is done in OpenVSP, and the aerodynamics models takes the linear stability derivatives, the drag, lift, and control surface deflection increments, and calculates a uh, complete aircraft CL, or lift coefficient, drag coefficient, and moment coefficient. Uh, especially during hover, uh, a lot of these control uh, surfaces will be operating at extremely high angles of attack because of uh, uh, the fact that the aircraft is not moving uh, very fast and may be traveling vertically upwards or downwards. Therefore, in order to extend some of the uh, uh, coefficients of lift and drag that we had uh, calculated for these surfaces, we used the Viterna and Corrigan model to uh, calculate uh, lift and drag coefficients post-stall and at extremely high or low angles of attack. Currently, a simplified rotor model is implemented in the 3 dof code, where the uh, thrust is controlled solely with RPM control uh, with an average lift co uh, or thrust coefficient that is assumed. The side force and pitching moment are currently ignored, but we've been able to still provide some meaningful results with this simplified uh, uh, rotor model, which I'll be showing later on. We're currently working on integrating a more advanced rotor model with a uh, vortex particle method code called DUST. DUST allows us to generate a data set with the inputs as the free stream velocity, the angle of the free stream to the rotor, uh, the RPM of the rotor, and the pitch of the rotor, and outputs all of the forces and moments in all three axes. With that data set, we can use basis functions to create a surrogate model for the uh, rotor that allows us to quickly query uh, different points uh, for optimization purposes. Finally, the force moment and accounting routine takes the aircraft weight, drag, the aerodynamic forces of the wing, tail, and rotor, and calculates the acceleration of the aircraft in the stability axis, and it calculates the angular acceleration in the pitch axis. These accelerations are then fed into the um, optimizer. As I said previously, currently there's no interactional effects between uh, all of these forces uh, from the wing, tail, and fuselage model, but that is something uh, that we are looking into uh, integrating into the model. Uh, the optimization setup is shown on this slide. The objective is to minimize the sum of thrust squares. Currently, with the simplified rotor model, we are not able to actually uh, get the power required for uh, the rotor. So in order to act as a surrogate for that, we decided to create an objective function that minimizes the sum of the thrust of the front rotors and the rear rotors squared. Um, this uh, is subject to the constraint that all of the accelerations that I described from the force moment accounting routine are equal to zero, therefore trimming the aircraft off. Uh, during this uh, flight condition. The optimizer is allowed to control uh, the aircraft angle of attack, the tail incidence, uh, because there is no elevator on the configuration that we're looking at. Um, the entire, it's an all-moving tail. It also controls a front uh, rotor tilt angle, the flap deflection, and the front and rear rotor RPMs to control thrust. Each of these controls are bounded, as shown below. Some of these bounds may seem extremely wide, but the reason why the angle of attack bounds are so large is because during hover, some of these uh, surfaces are seeing extremely high angles of attack if you're traveling downwards and so on. So that's why the bounds of these controls are so large. The me optimization method is a gradient-based global optimization with SNOP. We've implemented analytical derivatives for each of the models I discussed uh, previously in Open MDAO. This uh, sped up the optimization substantially because the optimizer doesn't have to finite difference through all of the different controls uh, that it has. Additionally, 100 random points uh, are chosen throughout the space with uh, Latin hypercube sampling to ensure that the entire space is covered and that we don't fall into any local optimum solutions and we're able to uh, calculate the actual global optimum uh, for a given trim condition. So here are some of the preliminary results for a level transition, which is probably the most important case uh, for uh, describing uh, some of the uh, analysis that we 
uh, want. As you can see on the left, there's a graph of the various controls like front rotor tilt, tail incidence, flap deflection, and aircraft pitch. Um, and on the right is the thrust produced by the front four set of rotors and the uh, rear uh, four set, uh, set of rotors. The front rotor tilt is kind of what you would expect it to be at hover. It's around 90 degrees, which is expected. And then as the aircraft moves forward, uh, it slowly tilts forward uh, to produce some amount of thrust while still generating lift. As the aircraft uh, uh, achieves a flight speed close to the stall speed of the aircraft, around 50 to 60 knots, the front rotor is able to tilt all the way forward to an aircraft configuration, like a typical propeller. Uh, this is because the wing is now uh, generating most of the lift needed to uh, keep the aircraft flying, so the uh, rotor is able to produce solely thrust for the aircraft and doesn't have to lift up the aircraft. The flap deflection for the um, uh, level transition uh, starts at zero because there's very little benefit to deflecting the flaps at such low speeds since there's not much forces being generated from the control surfaces, but then quickly goes up to 15 degrees, which is the maximum flap deflection that we allowed because uh, you want to create as much lift as possible at these lower speeds so your rotors don't have to work as hard. Um, as the aircraft transitions past stall speeds and eventually speeds up, the flap deflection goes uh, slowly down because the wing is generating enough lift to actually uh, keep the aircraft up. The tail incidence is actually quite interesting and the optimal result was uh, kind of interesting to think about. At first, the uh, tail incidence actually goes to a very high positive deflection because the aircraft wants to use the tail to um, increase uh, lift and reduce the load on the rotors. However, uh, as the aircraft starts speeding up, there is more lift being uh, produced on the wing, or it's easier to produce lift on the wing, so the tail has to decrease its deflection to uh, increase the aircraft's angle of attack or pitch. Eventually, as you come closer to stall speed, the uh, tail incidence goes uh, negative because you need to uh, produce a positive angle of attack for the aircraft so that the wing is able to uh, generate as much lift as possible, especially at those really low stall speed areas around 50 to 60 knots. As the aircraft speeds up, uh, the tail incidence gets closer and closer to zero because the angle of the attack of the aircraft does not have to be as high to produce the same amount of lift, lift at higher speeds. On the right, you can see the thrust for uh, the rotors. The rear four set of rotors start at 100 pounds, which is necessary uh, to actually uh, hover this aircraft that we are analyzing. And then as the aircraft speeds up, uh, the rotors uh, produce less and less lift because the wing is uh, sharing most of that lift. And then eventually, once the wing is able to uh, produce enough lift for the aircraft to fly in completely aircraft mode, the rotors turn off, uh, uh, basically, allowing us to save power and decreasing the drag of those rear rotors. The front rotors is quite interesting because it actually increases at the beginning because the um, rotors need to work slightly harder as the uh, aircraft can't actually, uh, the wings and the tail can't actually produce enough lift, but you want to decrease the thrust from the rear rotor. So initially, the front rotor actually increases its thrust, and then eventually, as the wings share the lift, it goes down, similar to the rear rotor, and uh, it can't go completely to zero because you need some thrust to maintain the, the flight speed. So, But it does reduce the thrust significantly from what is necessary at hover. So the optimization is actually able to trim the aircraft at all of those flight speeds. The graph on the left is a... Uh, uh, graph of the constraint violations, so how far away from zero acceleration uh, we are. And as you can see, uh, as, especially if you notice that the y-axis is actually multiplied by 10 to the negative 10, uh, these constraint violations are extremely small, meaning that the aircraft is successfully being able to trim, uh, be able to, or the optimization routine is able to successfully trim the aircraft at all of these flight speeds at a zero flight path angle. Uh, the graph on the right is quite interesting because it shows the number of local optimum solutions that were found um, 
at various flight path angles and velocities. As you can see, there are actually a lot of local optimum, uh, ranging from around two solutions for a given flight path angle and velocity, all the way up to eight solutions. So it is fairly important to actually try those 100 random points at each of these flight path angles and velocities because there's a lot of local so, uh, so, uh, optimum and you don't want to be falling into those local optimums. You want to find the actual global optimum, uh, which is an interesting result. And it makes sense because the aircraft's so many different actuators that there are different solutions for each of these flight path angles and velocities. So finally, for the results, we were able to kind of get an initial control allocation for an optimal transition, especially a level transition. Uh, an interesting graph here is shown on the right, which is a Hoder graph where the uh, radial uh, axis is the flight path angle and the circumferential axis is the flight speed. So uh, you can see the thrust required to trim the aircraft at these various flight speeds and uh, uh, and uh, flight path angles. So if you're willing to lose some altitude when you transition the aircraft from hover to forward flight, you can uh, take a route that requires less thrust. And then once you're fully trans into, transitioned into airplane mode, you're able to uh, increase your uh, thrust and use your tail to gain back that altitude, which would be easier than gaining that, uh, which may be easier than transitioning completely level, which provides some interesting results for uh, this uh, three DOF code. But uh, as I said previously, there are a lot of local optima. So we've kind of explored some of these other local optimum solutions. And it seems like there are actually some uh, families of different solutions that you can uh, see in the data. That means that there are definitely different ways that you can choose to allocate your controls through the transition region and figuring out which one is the most uh, relevant and optimal is something that we are uh, planning on exploring and we have uh, kind of done as previously shown. The results previously shown kind of uh, agree with the expected trends that you would expect for a tilt rotor aircraft. So looking at data from maybe like the uh, V-22 and the XV-15, the control allocation and thrust allocation in transition follow the expected trends, which is uh, uh, relative uh, nice to see for uh, this 3 DOF code. So some of the future work that we're planning on doing uh, to improve this code is to obviously implement the more advanced rotor model that I talked about earlier. Uh, second is to come up with an interactional uh, aerodynamics model that uh, does not require uh, such high fidelity as CFD, but maybe is able to work at a much uh, faster rate so we're actually able to optimize uh, all of these design points. Finally, something uh, as a more long-term goal is to integrate DIMOS, which is a module from, open, uh, from the creators of OpenMDAO, which will allow us to perform dynamic trajectory optimization for this transition. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people who helped me with this project, which include my research advisor, uh, the grad student that I worked with, Daniel uh, Sagan, who uh, worked on a lot of the optimization portions of this code and helped quite a bit with, uh, in developing this code. And then the other undergraduate researchers that I've been working with in Dr. German's lab that have helped me uh, create this code. So are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? 